Fierce friends, we are going to do you a massive favor today. <laughs> <laughs> Take that initiative. Way to go, Yeah, babe. you know Way what? To go. It's, this is one of the things I feel like a lot of couples just need someone to just say it how it is. Okay. And help them out. Because a lot of the weirdness around sex is because a lot of couples, they, they, they don't know how to, like, it's unspoken. Like, who's supposed to initiate? How, how often should we be doing it? What's it supposed to be like? Like what, right? That can be weird, especially if you're a young couple. Yes. And you've gotten out of the honeymoon stage where you're just. Yeah. How do we, how and, do we live this out? This? Kind of hit the cruising altitude and you realize <laughs> like it, it can, it gets weird. And pretty soon if you, if you're not careful, you can start to drift apart. So mm-hmm. it is our conviction. I say our, I mean, in both of us. And this is a fairly recent conviction that we've arrived at mm-hmm. by the grace of God is that it is right, good and true for the husband to be the primary initiator of sex in marriage. It's right, good, and true for the husband to be the primary initiator in sex. I didn't say only, but I didn't say primary. So we're going to unpack that today's episode on the other side. So Selena, when you hear that, when you hear that the husband should be the primary initiator, what goes through your mind as a wife? What, what does that make you think? Hmm. You better ask nicely. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and that's, that's actually episode. funny because I didn't say ask. And that's that's ask is not the ah. word. Initiates the word, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> I'm just trying to set well, it up for you. That's how does that all. make you feel, though? I told you, initiate. It's a little. It's a little off putting if you're not ready to have your marriage be like that. <laughs> okay. Initiate feels like a strong word, but that's no, what it is. Th- it's supposed to be. Okay, but how does that make you feel as a wife? Well, in our covenant, it makes me feel relieved. But Okay, that's what I was getting at. Okay, I'm like, I don't know. For other people, it's probably, that's not the word that probably comes to mind, right? Right off the well, bat. Well, this could either be something that you're like, screw those guys. I'm not listening to Ryan and Selena anymore. <laughs> or you can be like, thank you. What? And that we're hoping that, because it's a bit of a paradigm shift for a lot of couples. Because, yeah. Well, I think too many uh, times we're asking the wrong question. How often and why and all that? Well, let's get to the... So let's get to the deeper question here. Here's what I really dislike is the idea that, and I, I'll say this, like Selena or the wife is the keeper of the cookies. And anytime a husband wants a cookie, <laughs> she has to go ask, he has to go ask, wife, can I please have another cookie? And if he's lucky, if he's been a good boy, <laughs> she'll give him a cookie. <laughs> I don't, I cannot stand that because that to me, it, it is, it's unhealthy. It undermines the, the purpose of it. It's a wrong it, the roles are all messed up. There's no. Yes. It belittles it. It it makes the whole thing yuck to me. It's like <laughs> a husband should not be groveling or at, like asking is not the right word. I don't think now it's, we can have a conversation. I can initiate that conversation with mm-hmm. you. But to me, like the whole, like happy wife, happy life. You know, like you talk to these guys, like old guys who th- are trying to be funny, but have like told the same joke for 30 years. You talk to him, they're like, Oh, how long have you been married? I'm married, you know, the X number of years. He's like, Oh, I've been married 40 years. Let me tell you the key to that. A healthy marriage. Ready, ready, son. Keep your wife happy. Am I right? <laughs> like as long as she's happy, I'm happy. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life. Like, bro. I mean, there is some truth to that, but it doesn't mean oh, yes. you have to get, but like our happiness does not, is not. Yeah. Like it's not dependent on me just placating you. Yes. That's very patronizing too. That's very patronizing. It's like minimizing. We're not in a covenant. We are in a parent child relationship is what it, (laughs) and that's not what a covenant is. If I can just keep my wife happy, like she can throw me a cookie this week. Yeah. Well, that's, and I've talked to too many guys that are like, my wife is upset with me. So now, you know, there's no way that we're going to, I'm not going to get any tonight. That's for sure. (laughs) Great. I just ruined it. Now for three days, I don't have a chance. (laughs) That's already been a week and a half. (laughs) Like, bro, I don't mean to no. laugh, but that's not, that's not the culture that you have to live in. Or that guys are like tiptoeing around this stuff because, oh, if I don't ask right, then she's going to just, she's going to have a headache or she's <laughs> going to be tired or she's going to, you know, like that. It's a, it's a lose, lose situation. Yeah, Instead, you can't wait for the perfect. If you can initiate for the right reasons in the right way, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be liberating for your entire, for you, for your wife, for your marriage. It's mm-hmm. going to enliven your sex life. We'll talk about that here. So long intro. I'm Ryan. This is Selena. We're the Fredericks. <laughs> we do the Fierce Marriage Podcast. Thank you for joining us. We pray that it's helpful and edifying to you. If you want to join join arms with us, 
walk arms with us, become one I'll of the walk fierce. Arms with you you're the, the original time. fierce fellowship mm-hmm. member. Uh, <laughs> go to fiercemarriage.com slash partner, and we would really enjoy that. Uh, we would love that. And we'd love to meet you there. Okay, so here's the thesis. I already said it, but I'm gonna say it again. It is right and good for husbands to be the primary initiators of sex in marriage. It's right and good for husbands to be the primary initiators of sex in marriage. So I'm gonna talk about why that's good. But first, let's talk about maybe get some of these elephants. Let's call yeah, out people are hearing a lot of other things right now in their heads. <laughs> yeah. So what do we mean by this? Well, first, let's talk about why husbands maybe don't feel like they can initiate. Mm-hmm. Okay. So here's the first one is they don't know how. They don't know how. They don't know how to ask or initiate. They don't know how to bring it up because they don't know how to communicate their own needs, their desires to their wives mm-hmm. in a mature and godly way. Okay. Uh, second, they feel a lot of shame, like they're asking for something that is wrong or bad. And that, yeah. that's a both husband and wife, I think to blame for that so kind of like culture. If you've conditioned that sure. in your marriage, they can feel like it's wrong or bad because they have a history. They can feel like it's wrong or bad because yeah, they've created this culture like, oh, you're asking me to do the deed and the <laughs> deed is a big pain in the neck all the time. Therefore you're asking <laughs> yeah. a lot from yeah. me. Okay. Which is, leads into the next ones, which is number three is husbands can feel like they're being selfish mm-hmm. because I want it and she doesn't. Right. Or maybe she, I want it and she doesn't want it right now in the exact same way in this exact moment. Therefore, the I'm being selfish to bring it yeah. up. <laughs> the fourth one is they feel like they're asking too much of their wives. Now, I think there, we'll talk about this. There's caveats here. So please don't like yeah. stick with the episode. If you've listened this far, just listen to the rest. Okay. <laughs> there are times when it would be asking too much of your, of your wife. Yeah. Um, and husband, you need to open your eyes and discern when those times are before That's you. That's nicely put. <laughs> you need to, you need to be I'm discerning. Let you say those things. <laughs> <laughs> be discerning because you need to be able to read the room. God's giving you such a great brain to just <laughs> use it. Come on. Well, <laughs> listen, if you've just got home from a trip, you've got kids and everybody's tired and bedraggled and the, they're, everything's a mess and life Don't give chaotic. your wife the look, okay? Of like, hey, let's head upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, yeah. Let's head to the bedroom. There's a thousand reasons why you can look at your wife and say, you know what? The best way I can love my wife is by not initiating right now. <laughs> because it. And wife, take note. Okay. Just yeah. take note. Cause yeah. that uh, there's sometimes where you, yeah. But the, one of the reasons men don't ever ask or it, ever initiate right. is because they feel like they're asking That's too always, much. Yeah. Always. Yeah. And because for whatever reason they feel that way. <laughs> Um, another reason they don't in- initiate is that past experience or relational trauma has tainted their approach and distorted their view of intimacy. Mm-hmm. And so it, it goes back to the first one is you feel like, you're, or the second one, you feel like you're asking for something wrong mm-hmm. or the fact that you want it is inherently bad and not, and, and, and since not it's not spontaneous, truth. yeah, right. Or that's another reason they don't ask is they feel like they have to be spontaneous. Like if I don't just like glance at you and all of a sudden you're tackling me, then I've somehow st- snuffed the flame. Right. <laughs> I've somehow killed the, the passion. Not true. Like I, I can say, okay, we've been married 20 years. Um, the spontaneous side of it with the kids, it's not very often that never hardly ever happens. I sometimes I feel like it is spontaneous cause you're like, everybody's in a good place. Let's go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not a necessity, not necessarily like passion, <laughs> but it's not like, yeah, it's not like we, you know, it, I don't know what, what is the, what are you envisioning when right. it's supposed to be spontaneous? Like, Oh, I just, we're, we're just, we're on the couch watching a movie and all of a sudden I just like to start like just touching you just right. <laughs> giving you, you know, got, we're in the right cologne, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what. And all of a sudden, you know, we were, we're in the throes of intimacy. Yeah. Not when you got kids upstairs about to wake up. (laughs) And so husbands won't initiate because they feel like it has to be some, some Hollywood Mm. version of Hollywood garbage. So just get rid of all that. Um, And then I want to ask the question is, do wives contribute maybe to this? Not, this is to throw wives under the bus, but you know, Mm. wives are part of this situation. Well, sometimes unknowingly too, right? We, we, as wives, we too have our insecurities, our past traumas, or, um, you know, the shame and things that we're dealing with, uh, right desires and whatnot. So yeah, I think we all contribute to this lack or the inability to initiate. And if you've created a culture in your marriage, the two of you, husband and wife, mm-hmm. where the wife is the keeper of the treasure. And if the treasure <laughs> keeper 
<laughs> is not satisfied. If he's not satisfied, the gods <laughs> don't expect them to rain to no. rain down on your <laughs> you need lands. To rephrase that. No, but okay. that's that's the attitude, it's right? Like, you keep the treasure. I always want the treasure. So if I want some of the treasure, I got to keep you happy. You got to be nice. Yeah. Is that a healthy way to approach it? Right. Is that, a, is that initiation? Hmm. No. Or you've created the culture where it's common or it's become commonplace that the wife has enough times has blown off the desires or the needs that the yeah. husband has expressed. It says, ah, you're just, no. Yeah. You know, he's Dismissed dropping it. hints and she's not picking it up or she's ignoring. Or she's intentionally not picking it. Yeah. Um, there's the, or she quote, has a headache <laughs> every day, <laughs> every day. Who's the, uh, it's the dude dad, isn't it? Dude dad. Yeah. They have a thing where he, it's kind of, he dresses, <laughs> <laughs> it's comedy. All right. So he dresses up as his wife and like talks like his wife yeah, and, mimics she her. Does this, and he mimics or she mimics him. And it's just very gratuitous and funny. And her whole thing is like, I have a headache. <laughs> yeah. He's like, so you want to, and she's like, I have a headache. <laughs> So clearly they have a really healthy marriage and they laugh together and that's funny because they put it on Instagram for everyone to see, which is, I couldn't do it. <laughs> no, we do it this way. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, or maybe she devalues intimacy or invalidates his need or she expresses that it's a huge pain or inconvenience or whatever. So all of these would lead to, if you create this culture, yeah, you'll, it'll lead to this, like sex is kind of always taboo. It's, it's always the elephant in the room. No one's really talking about it. Yeah. Or no you don't know how you're trying. There's maybe, not clarity around yeah. it. There's not clear expectations and boundaries. There's mm -hmm. not clear understanding of what it is meant to accomplish, which is what the next part is all about. Right. Is we need to set the record straight and we encourage you uh, married couples to take this in because what is the reality of sex? Because if you have a, a misconstrued reality of what sex is, what it accomplishes in a marriage, mm -hmm. that will affect how you approach it. That will affect even how you receive this podcast mm -hmm. where I say the husband should initiate. Mm -hmm. Because if you're right now thinking that, that sex is all about physical satisfaction and that sometimes it's about having a baby, then you're missing it. Mm -hmm. You're missing it. And I hope you've made it this far without just turning up because sex is not about, it's not, about the physical, it's not even primarily physical. Sex is covenant renewal. Mm. And what I mean by that is when we, when you get married, you, you have the sign of your covenant, which is your, your ring, mm -hmm. your wedding ring. I, I took mine off. I, I was going to show it off. I took it off to I'm show kidding. it. I'm okay. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just, just chill. Just relax. Okay, buddy. Just <laughs> That's the sign of your covenant. But then there's the sealing of the covenant, mm -hmm. the sign and the seal. Well, what's the seal? Well, it's the consummation of the covenant, which is the two becoming one flesh through the act of sex, mm -hmm. namely sexual intercourse. Like you don't just have it once. Like wait, we've signed, we've, we have the sign and we've sealed it. Now we're married. Yeah. Like, you know, there's covenant renewal. Right. And you and so every time you are entering into sex together, mm -hmm. I thought that's the weirdest way I could possibly put that. Anytime you're having sex. You're into, you, you, yeah, you, you decide to engage in sex together. You're not just physical beings doing physical things. You are physical and spiritual beings doing physical and spiritual things. Mm -hmm. That involve your emotions as well. <laughs> namely, yeah. Namely covenantal renew renewal. And what this does is if you have this understanding of it, is it contextualizes sex and it dispels the lie that sex, namely in this context, is just a guy trying to get his jollies from his wife. Right. Yeah. If a wife views that, if a wife views sex in that same term, in that context, then of course she's not going to be ready to jump in bed with him. Right. When it's just a one sided, it feels like a one sided, uh, activity <clears throat> here, even though, right. Right. She is kind of the end. The wife is the end all for this activity. Like well, you can't go somewhere the else for, for the wife. Right. You don't so, go somewhere else. Are you going to do the sandwich theory? <laughs> I could talk about it in a minute. I want to get through these other ones. And I'm going to talk about what, so object, like no one wants to be objectified. Now this is going to ruffle some feathers here. No one wants to be objectified, but in marriage, the wife is the object of the husband's affection and the husband is the object of the wife's affection. It can be no other way. That's how God designed now, it. It's possible to do that and to say that without objectifying one another. And right. we'll, I'll define what that means in a minute. Um, so reality about sex. One, it's not just about the physical, it's covenant renewal. Two, sex is good and beautiful for married people to have. And it's mm -hmm. good and beautiful for married people to have good sex. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So married sex is good sex. Underlying that, Mm -hmm. underlying that is that God made it and he called it good. Mm -hmm. God made it specifically exclusively for marriage. You say underlying that. I'm just saying this is the found, this is the piece. This is the foundation. This is why sex is good. It's because God called it good. It's because God made it for marriage. Right. Amen. And God made sex desirable. He didn't, it's not like we're touching elbows (laughs) and we're having babies by touching elbows. (laughs) (laughs) Like, No, it's so much more. He made it so much better. Yes. Right. Yes. God made it desirable and enjoyable. Okay. So sex is not just physical. It's good. And then finally, the reality about sex is that it's not wrong to want sex and it's not wrong to go to one's wife or husband for it. Right. Now, these are like sitting in a, in a Bible classroom or sitting in a marriage conference. No one would say, wait, yes, it is wrong. That No one would say that. But the problem is our behavior ends mm-hmm. up acting as if you've asked for something There's, that you, I yeah, shouldn't give to you. Those unspoken sort of beliefs. I mean, these are things that I we've had to work through. I mean, call it a blame on purity culture or whatever you want, but it's still... There, there are themes that we have to understand. Like purity is not, yes, purity is abstaining from sex for marriage, but the abstaining, like not having sex is not like more holy than having sex in your marriage, right? Like there's right. <clears throat> e- both are equal, equally good, equally pure, equally created by God for a purpose, for his purpose, for his glory, for multiplication of, of, and fruitfulness. So in our minds, sometimes we elevate things that we're not meant to be elevated. We disorder things. We're yeah. really good at that, right? In our sinful yeah. brokenness. Yeah. Purity culture gets a bad rap because of the, how far people went off that end. Right. But it's like, to me, it's, it's akin to like telling people who don't have driver's licenses to not drive. Like right. don't drive until you have a driver's license. Yeah. Doesn't mean never drive once you have one. It just right. means like once you have one, drive to your heart's content. Yeah, you'll understand the but, the purpose and the weight of it. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it's good to want to drive. Yes, and driving is good. It's <laughs> when awesome. You have your license. <laughs> drive fast. <laughs> um, okay. No, but I, but so it's not so it's not wrong for a husband to want right sex from his wife. It's not, it's not wrong why. for a wife to want yeah. it from her husband. In fact, it's holy. Mm-hmm. It's good. And this is where you're getting at before. Um, it's not wrong. I'll use this analogy. Okay. A sandwich. Okay, I've said this before, but like, if I want a sandwich, I could ask you for a sandwich. I could go make myself a sandwich, but say I maybe or you could go buy a sandwich. <laughs> right. And all those things would be morally good. Right. Right. It's good to make good food. Well, I can't do that with this desire. If I have a desire for you, sex drive, sexual desire, I can't go and satisfy that desire anywhere else. Any anyone else or anywhere else. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can, but, it's, but sinful. it's not morally good. It's sinful. Yeah, it's sinful. And so that, that's why I get around to this this object piece because if you think in, all the grammar nerds will will have their day in the sun right now, but <laughs> I will. It will always be Ryan or I want Selena. Subject verb object, right? You are the only good object for me to place my. The only right object. Predicate on. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you, could, you could swap out the verb, right? So like, I desire you. I desire to be close to you. I, yeah. I want you in whatever way. But you're always going to be at the end of that sentence. Yeah. And I'm always going to be the end of your sentence. I'm always going to be the only now where you get in, into the objectification categories when you no longer see as a person, but now it's a thing. Right. So now if I see you as the object of my desire and I don't really care for you as a person, which is categorically ontologically different. Right. You have emotions, you have belief, you have a consciousness, yeah. you have all these things that make you a person that are wonderful. Soul. The soul. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm doing a sidebar. I'm, I'm doing a biblical, an- I'm reading on biblical anthropology right now. And it's like, <laughs> what is the substance of a soul? <laughs> what is the substance of a human? And it's really like heady stuff. So yes, you nailed it. Soul. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, you don't even You're need the course. You're taking all those Selena pieces apart. It. <laughs> it's good. But the point is, is like, it will always be you. If you and treat me like an object, then what do you expect, you know, from that, from that sort of treatment? A person will not respond well to being treated like an object. When you're, a person is treated like a person, like a human right. being with a soul, with love and care and sacrificial, you know, love, then clearly the response will be different. Right. My desire for you will be different. And the whole point I want to make here is that that is good. It is good for you to be at the end of each other's sentences. Mm-hmm. 
from and so but oftentimes we treat that as bad like i'm surprised like why would you want this from right me? right <laughs> why would you come to me for this <laughs> all right okay so let's go a little bit further i want to talk about some pitfalls i mean might need to break this into two episodes because we're getting up to 25 minute territory here um there's some pitfalls to avoid. Okay. So as we talk about these things and why men should initiate, maybe I'll punt that part to the next episode. Um, but I want to get these pitfalls out of the way and then we'll go to that part. Number one pitfall, initiating does not mean being demanding. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what people can hear when mm -hmm. you hear initiate. It's like, Whoa, Whoa. Let's not just, you know, <laughs> initiate. <laughs> It, there's more to that word. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think of it like this, like the, any analogy you use, I feel like it's going to be a, 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 what's the word? It's going to be crude in a sense and inadequate. But like, if I have this game that I really want to play and I put it on the table and I say, I'm initiating, what do you say we play this game together? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all initiating is. Yeah. It's like, or I think we should play this game together because it means we can have fun together and yeah. I want to have fun with you and I yeah. love you. Yeah. And so I'm going to put this out, out there and you can say, oh, sweetheart, I really appreciate that you initiated that. Let's do it. Yeah. Or I appreciate you initiated that, but I'm super tired. And can we maybe play the game tomorrow or can we play right. it after I sleep two hours tonight and wake <laughs> up in the middle of the night? <laughs> so again, the analogies fall short, but initiating doesn't mean that you're being demanding. Demanding right. is we're going to play this game right now or I'm going to throw a fit. Yeah. And you better play it with me or I'm going to be, I'm going to hold you emotionally hostage. And yeah. I'm going to be frustrated. I'm going to pout and I'm going to be angry. Yeah. And, and you're and now having to respond to my whims and, and I'm holding you hostage. Yes. My tantrums. That is not covenantal marriage. Um, and that is not what love looks like. So here's what I said here. Every emotion to initiate is a motion to have dialogue. It means that I'm now putting this on the table mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. And so a husband who is being loving will always have his wife's needs in view. Mm -hmm. I mean, and if you're literally asleep, I'll keep, I'll keep the analogy going. Go. I'm not talking Go. about in bed. Yeah. I'm talking about if you're clearly tired, the kids are cranky and you're making dinner. I'm not going to be like, Hey, and you're like stirring something on the stove. <laughs> I'm like, Hey, I got this game. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that husband needs to read the room. Right. Now is not the time to, read to the play room. the game yes. or to propose playing the game. And don't feel rejected if your wife hints at you to say, hey, hun, let's read the room a little bit. <laughs> right? But so often as you get young Man husbands, <laughs> you get a young husband who doesn't have that discernment Stumbling yet. Stumbling into it, yeah, a little bit. And, you know, and he'll say, hey, I know we just played this game a few hours ago, but I want to <laughs> play the game again. And his wife kind of, you know, thinks, you must be kidding. Yeah. Like, I just played the game. I don't want to play that game right now. I'm, I have to do this other stuff. Well, that can sometimes turn into the right. types of behavior we outlined up above right. or back when we started the episode is that maybe you start creating a culture of not feeling free to initiate and the wife being used to re rejecting in some way. Right. <clears throat> and so this is why you have to keep it, keep the growing going as well, they say. Yeah. And the resiliency I think too. Right. So keep the wife's, um, uh, needs needs in view. Any other approach is unloving. Ideally, the husband can read the situation before initiating and instead initiate another type of intimacy building. So I keep using the example if you're tired or whatever. Well, I can still initiate connection with you. Mm -hmm. And a loving husband will initiate a connection that is going to be mutually edifying. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go down that path instead of just looking mutually for the one. Mutually good. That's mutually that edifying, not manipulating. Okay. And the final pitfall here, and there are more, but the last one I want to touch on here is initiating doesn't mean that anything goes. Mm. So it doesn't give the husband carte blanche to do whatever he wants. That's not what we're saying. And I hope that you didn't get that from this only that the husband is, you know, the captain of this ship, so to speak, mm -hmm. you're going to steer it toward a Harbor where we can go play the game, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to go steer it into the Harbor and run it aground. Right. Right. There are things within bounds, meaning that everything that within the marriage bed needs to be done in purity and a spirit of love and a spirit of edification, edification mm -hmm. and, and caring for one another. Trust. Yeah. I trust you not okay. to run this into the ground. Like I trust you not to break our ship. I trust you not to, no. you know, ruin the game. No. So. Okay. So we've gone over time here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to punt to next week. I'm sorry, but we have to do this. And we're going to talk about why men are built to be leaders in the home and why that should also apply to your sex life your intimate life. Mm -hmm. So if we've kept you this far, I'm happy. I'm thrilled. Join us for next week and we'll cover the rest. Um, if you don't know who Jesus is, we want you to know him, uh, to find out who he is. We recommend 
two things. Talk to a friend who you know to be a Christian. If you, if you have one and they're a Christian, you ideally would know that they're a Christian. Mm-hmm. And you go talk to them say, hey, I want to read the Bible with you. Who's Jesus? What does he mean? For, what does his life mean for my life? Mm. Hopefully they'll do that with you. Secondly, find a church where you can hear from God's word. By God's word, I mean the Bible. Mm-hmm. We believe it is inerrant and given by God so that we might know him, so that it's his revelation telling us how to be saved. Mm-hmm. You need to be taught that stuff. So go to a church where they teach that stuff. If you can't find either of those things, go to this website, thenewsisgood.com. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the gift of intimacy in marriage. I thank you that uh, you have made it exactly what you meant to make it. Mm-hmm. I pray that you'd help us um, step into that as couples um, sitting under your lordship, sitting under your design for marriage and covenant. I pray that you would help us open our eyes to the beauty and the wonder of what it is that's before us for our enjoyment, for your glory and for our good. We love you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'd love it if you would partner with us through the Fierce Fellowship. Let's mm-hmm. go to fiercemarriage.com slash partner. That said, we'll see you next week for the conclusion of this episode. Mm-hmm. So this episode of Fierce Marriage is... In the can. We'll see you again in about seven days. Until next time. Stay fierce.